Hope everyone's doing well. Welcome to the Magia Mindset. Our guest today is the lead instructor for U.S. soccer coaching education. He is going to help us discuss and break down philosophy, methodology, and periodization, and how to incorporate them throughout a season, training sessions, to maximize performance for the matches. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome our guest on the show again, Antel Vergier. Roll the intro. Antel, thank you for joining us again. Uh, it was a pleasure having you on, on t- in 2020. And as we're getting the ball rolling in 2021, I appreciate you joining us in. And I know for you in 2020 was uh, a great time in a, in a sense of having a newborn. So congratulations on that. And it's an absolute pleasure having you on again. Great to be back, Sean. Yeah, and like you mentioned, it's 2020 was a... Um, a weird year for me, um, knowing what's going on in the world right now. Also knowing that my uh, baby girl was born. So I was in between emotions and, and concerns and all those things. But uh, hopefully we can move on from there. No, for sure. One of the things I wanted to kind of get into um, for our topic in today and discussing, obviously, U- U.S. soccer coaching education is the philosophy, you know, what is it in um, establishing a philosophy? And does it vary from age groups you establish it in? And what are the priorities on those? Yeah, you can look at philosophies from different perspectives. Uh, So you can have an educational philosophy. Um, You can have a philosophy on the game and how the game is being played. There is a teaching philosophy, so there are multiple philosophies. Our, our starting point is, um, because we're in coaching education, is an educational philosophy. So uh, what uh, that philosophy is basically what drives us on a daily basis when we organize courses, when we uh, guide and help uh, coaches here in the country. And that philosophy is based on three tenets, and uh, the overarching one is reality-based. Um, we strongly believe in the transfer uh, of information to a a real situation. Um, And that means there could be uh, the reality of uh, the environment of the coach. Uh, could also be the the reality of the environment of the course. So for for each course, we created an environment and then we created content uh, uh, for that. uh, So people can start to... Uh, collaborate on that content and learn from that content in that specific course environment. And now they can also hopefully uh, transfer that to their personal environment. And one thing that is important for us in reality base is that the game is always the starting point. Uh, So we start from the perspective of the game and then uh, how do we now transfer our knowledge and connect that to the game? Um, And that, so, so that is one uh, one tenant. The other one is uh, experiential learning. So if if you want to develop yourself, you need to go through a process. And that process starts with an experience. Uh, you do something. You look back on that something. Uh, that could be based on feedback from the instructor. Could be face, based on feedback from that situation. Can be based on feedback from peer coaches, or maybe it's self-feedback. Um, you reflect on that experience. From that experience, you extract new concepts, new ideas, new information. You now start to apply that again. In, uh, in, uh, and so, you, so you gain a new experience, and then the circle goes on and on and on. And so it's a constant process. Um, so um, that is, that's the second thing we believe in, uh, um, experiential learning. So not just based on theory only, uh, but how do you now take that theory, how do you apply it, and how do you now uh, reflect on that experience based on that theory. And the third one is a holistic approach. So we look, um, so you can see that from multiple layers. Uh, We don't see 
candidates as candidates first. We see them as persons first. And then what does that mean for their role as a coach? So we don't want to educate them only as a coach, but we want to educate them as, you know, as, an, as a complete human being. Um, and being a coach is just being part of that. Um, holistic approach is also the, intercon the interconnection between the different tasks of a coach. So we work with six tasks, um, coaching training, coaching game, uh, leading the team, leading the play, and managing the performance environment. And the overarching one is leadership. And they're all interconnected because if I'm coaching during a training session, there's always leading the team. There's always leading the player. There's always leadership. It always connects to what I want to do in the game as well. And there's always an environment that I need to manage to, to facilitate the best learning uh, situation for my players. Um, and we see holistic approach as that uh, the game is holistic. So we don't isolate things. Uh, so, for example, we don't look at tactics as something that is isolated but uh, uh, or technique, for example, but we look at, okay, what is, what is needed within the game? So what, what do players need within a certain moment of the game and how does it now relate to the communication? Uh, so what do they perceive and what do they send on information? What kind of decisions do they make and how do they execute that decision? So we see it from a uh, holistic perspective and we don't, let's say, isolate technique and then we work on technique and then we put it back in the game. No, we provide the game and then we work on all those concepts at the same time. No, fantastic. Um, how does the holistic approach as well as the leadership role um, vary from age groups now? Let's say we're starting from U12. Let's just start from U12 and then let's go to... Um, U18 and above, okay? Uh, how does it go from section to section of doing? Does it, does it differ? Is it different? Or is it a progression within it that goes like that in how you have to put a different coaching hat on depending on obviously what they've, even if they're an advanced group on tell is they're still developing in certain moments. So what is it in leading and the approach of a holistic point of view and setting up that session looks like based on those age groups. If you look at it from the perspective of holistic, you're not looking at the player solely, but you look at the person first and then the player, then that is universal. That's just a reference that applies for a U6 player or a U19 player. Um, because if you do not connect on a person level, it's going to be really difficult to develop them as players. And so there needs to be a connection. But how? Yeah, so, but the how is very subjective because how I would connect with you is different from how I would connect with another person based on who that person is and what that person needs. And you can imagine that a U6 kid needs a different approach from me as a coach, different language to connect than a U19 player. Um, but that there needs to be a connection that you need to start from understanding the person first and have generally a general of a genuinely interest in that person is important because if there's no connection, like I mentioned before, it's, it's, it's very difficult to develop people. So the reference for me would be the same and the what, but how you do that, that's subjective based on your situation, based on this, the, the person, but also who you are as a person. So that can differ. No, that's great. That's great. And then um, periodization, periodization in sessions for, for you. Let's just say someone is training. Um, it's a seven day a week kind of setup. Let's first break it down into being specific. So th this is for a coach that's training seven days a week. And it's not all seven days, meaning you have your game and then you have your five days of training of how you can manage it of off day as well as recovery session what is it in and does and obviously we're talking about in season in season what is it that it's got to be formatted what what are the thresholds you guys are looking for and and breaking that out and properly being able to maximize um high performance prior to the game yeah again you can look at certain references 
And then how you apply it references, again, is subjective because, again, everybody's situation is different. But what we're trying to do and, 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 and what I'm saying right now is something that we start with the B and then in the A. Um, so if we talk about soccer periodization, and it's, it's, it's the long-term planning of the development of your game model. Uh, so it's, and your game model is your, basically your game idea, the way you envision how your players need to play the game. And is is expressed through principles, for example. Um, yeah, you need to plan that, periodize that over time, and, and and how you can do that is to think about okay, if I have certain principles that I want to work on, how can I organize those principles? So, is there a hierarchy in those principles? Um, so, let's say you are a team that wants to. Uh, play through the lines uh, in attacking. Uh, so that's your game idea. Play through the lines, unbalance the opponent, draw them out, and then exploit the space in behind. If that is your idea. Okay, what kind of principles? And I'm now putting in place, and uh, because the principles will uh, are basically the intentions the players now can use to execute that. So what are those principles that will help my players focus more on? those attentions so we'll be on the same page so there will be less miscommunication um, so that is something you can plan out over time so you start for example with main principles bigger concepts that are relevant for all players within the team um, so let's work on those main principles first because then we have a better understanding about what our team intention is to achieve a certain goal um, then the next layer could be that, okay, what are the more specific principles? And you can call them uh, sub-principles within the main principles. And those provide more detailed, more complex information that can connect to a group of players, for example. So they can have a deeper understanding about how we can execute the main principles in different ways. And so those are the sub-principles. And then the next complex layer is the sub-sub-principles. And you can refer to those as the, the individual intention. So what is my individual intention within the main principle? And an example for that could be uh, uh, based on the game idea I just, I just mentioned. If we want to export space in behind of the opponent, okay, if I have the ball, my individual intention is to get the ball behind the back line um, as a midfielder, for example. But the intention of the individual intention of the number nine could be to drop in to draw out a center back so now my 11 can run in behind so we have three different individual intentions but we do that based on the main intention is to exploit space in behind right so now we can start to align our actions as well so that is one reference that we're trying to teach in the b and the a is okay how do you plan out you, you could say your tactical periodization over time main principles sub principles sub sub principles and over the longer term, but also how can you do that in a week? Um, so that's one. Also within periodization, uh, you also look at, uh, so let's say you plan from game to game. Uh, you mentioned a seven week, I have opportunity to plan out the, the seven days as if, if I want it, right? So I don't have any constraints there. I only know where the games are and what I do in between that. That's, that's open for me to, to fill it out. Yeah, you, you look back at, okay, we played a game. You can use information from that game to plan out your week. But most of the time, especially when you're in the youth game, you use the game as a check to see where in the, in the development are we and what can I use from that game to see, okay, I need to step up or I need to step back or I need to stay with the same thing because the players are still not getting it as I uh, thought they supposed to, uh, to get it. So... Uh, so, uh, so you can also look back at the game and then plan out your sessions. Um, and then you have to, uh, to and, and now the physical periodization comes into play. Uh, what is the demand per training session? If I am close, still close to the previous game, so the players are still recovering and adapting from the game, okay, my load will be a little bit lower. But once I move up into the week and the players are starting to recover and adapt, and they're back to their, uh, where they're uh, supposed to be, uh, my, I can start to increase my load. Uh, so now I can start to plan 
training sessions for physical development as well, or periodized physical development. Once I get closer to the new game, okay, I reduce the load to ensure readiness for the upcoming game. Um, and so you can look at from a tactical periodization, what are the principles within the game model I want to develop on the short term, on the long term, and, organize, and how do I organize them from main sub to sub sub, and how do I manage the energy of the players, and so how do I periodize that as well uh, in the week, in the training session, but also within the exercise. No, I mean, that's big. That's big. And obviously, we're just discussing uh, a privileged coach right there where they have seven days a week um, in a realistic world in the in the U.S., especially now that professional coaching is in play. That kind of training, obviously, you've got to have some financial resources to provide to the coach. But based on those situations, because financially what the team can provide or the club can provide, they're training twice a week if lucky, three times a week, and they'll go into their games in the weekend. And what usually teams try to do because they try to use the games as an educational, tactical development, they sometimes overload the games, meaning you'll get a game on a Saturday and another game on a Sunday. And you're trying to use it as training, as a setup. I want to kind of throw you a scenario saying a team is training and uh, you're taking over the team now, but they're accustomed to training Tuesday, Thursdays. They are accustomed to getting a game on Saturday and Sunday. Okay. And as a coach going in, because a lot of coaches go into these situations where they're accustomed and they're trying to set it up in a way they feel how they've been educated in the licenses of how to properly periodize players to, a, to an extent, because you're not getting these kids day in, day out. They go home, they come in. So there's only a certain control you can have. How do you come into that environment? That's very unique. And let's even throw this into the plan. On the Tuesday, Thursday, the reason they overload the games on Saturday, Sunday, because the Tuesday, Thursday sessions, they don't have the luxury of a full pitch. They have three fourths of a pitch. So they need to use the games to use a full game to teach movement, teach positioning for a certain uh, level. So that's why maybe they do that. If you're put into that situation, if we incorporate, let's say you're teaching them a style of play, but also periodizing your vision of how to prevent injuries, but maximize performance, how do you do that? And if it, And if so, is it even possible to kind of do something in those kind of environments. Yeah, that's very, very, very challenging. Uh, first and foremost, playing back-to-back -back games, if you don't have a very big roster, is not a good idea. Because you're just going to accumulate fatigue um, that will have a huge effect on the quality of action, uh, but also on the health of the players. And I can remember we had a conversation, a previous uh, conversation as well, so if you play on Saturday, yeah, normally it takes 72, to, 72 hours to actually recover from, in general, to recover from a game. So if you play the next game, you're just going to build on that fatigue even more. And it takes even longer for the players to recover and adapt from, from two games. If you have a very big roster and you can play with two teams, but that's normally not the case, um, but, but then you have a little bit more flexibility, right? You can play with your with 11 players on Saturday and maybe 11 players on Sunday as well. And then, then there will be no uh, fatigue in, in that regards. But uh, let's say that for most of the coaches in the, in the country, that's not, that's not the case, right? You only have 16 to 18 players and that's what I need to work with. So you're going uh, to uh, accumulate fatigue, which has consequences for the training week. Because if I know my players played a back-to-back, uh, so um, Saturday, sun, uh, yeah, Saturday, Sunday, and I train on. You mentioned Tuesdays and Thursday. Tuesday is is not a lot I can do because I already know that the players are still recovering from that back to back game. Um, so my load on that day and the amount or the uh, how long I will train will have a huge impact. Um, so that has an impact on teaching as well. If I only have a quarter field. It's 
basically impossible to work on main principles because main principles are team intentions, team concepts needs to be trained in bigger situations. So players can start to communicate with each other within um, uh, bigger situations. So if you play on a quarter field, you can only work with uh, small sided games, three against two, two v ones, four v four, maybe five v five, but it ends there. Right. And, it's very difficult to make it specific to uh, your game model as well because you can only train maybe on a quarter field exactly and you can never be actually in, in the space of the field where the players normally would be located. So it's the transfer of the information on the quarter field to the actual game is going to be very difficult for the players because you know it's, it's a different uh, situation. Um, and then in, that, in those small-sided games, you can mainly work on know individual intentions but if i don't have a good understanding about the main intentions the main principles it's going to be very difficult for me to execute individual intentions in those small sided activities so again yeah what coaches can do is is try to be creative so let's say you and i work together on one field maybe um i say hey sean can i use more space in the beginning of my training session so i can work on bigger concepts and then bring it back to smaller concepts. So at the end of the training session or halfway, you get more space from me and I reduce my space. So you have an opportunity to do that as well. And so you and I need to collaborate right now. Um, so that's one thing. Yeah, like I mentioned in the previous conversation, if a club is there and they and most clubs say, well, we're here for, for development, we want to develop players, then you need to create circumstances to actually develop players. And I'm not referring to U6, U7, U8. It's fine that they play in smaller spaces uh, because that is what they are used to in the game as well, right? They play 4v4 or 7v7. But once you get to 9v9s, 11v11s, at least you need to provide half a field a couple of times a week, maybe one or at least once or twice a week. So players are getting used to those spaces as well. The coach can help the players understand how the game model looks like in those bigger spaces as well. So players are better prepared for playing the game. And so hopefully clubs now start to realize as well that it's not about attracting more and more and more and more players with the consequence less and less and less space, which it impacts the quality of what we do with our players. If that is the case, then don't say we're here to develop players. Then say we're here to attract as much players as possible so we can generate more money yeah i mean that's that's where i think things get lost is obviously um personal lifestyle comes into play people want to generate money uh and when the money gets in, involved it hurts development you know if quantity increases quality decreases it's like having a session <laughs> you want to run a proper session uh, a player was actually telling me that he went to a trial with a pro team and he's like coach he had 50 players at the practice and we're running a session and some of them were not even high level but it's a mixture of that the qu quantity is so high you're not able to get any production in individually one and then as a team you're not going to get your topic across either there's no way i think some people especially in certain college situation they increase rosters to what increase enrollment it makes the college look good it's obviously money generated when money comes into play onto i totally agree it hurts the development of getting your vision into the team and i think sometimes we got to say the balance of look what is it you want do you very do you value the game to a point where you're like hey whatever money comes with it comes with it obviously you just need to uh, pay the certain things you need to but the priority should be get the to uh, topic across get your vision across implement your style of play and develop the individual within the whole then then you know whatever follows follows but i think we got the money development flipped you want the money first then the development follows where it should be the development first and then as you build a brand and go from there it follows it and then but done the right way so i totally agree if we transition from what we discussed at a at an elite level of having seven days a week to the club level where they train twice of periodization if we're going more into methodology now and we're going into system of play 
Okay. Obviously, um, the popular uh, modern game right now is a 4-3-3. But I want to kind of educate our audience that what what's the purpose of a 4-3-3? Okay. And what's the purpose of going in a, um, let's say, 4-5-1? Okay. What's the purpose of going into a 4-4-2? You know, Coach, is is there a set system you got to always go with? Do you do you go with the set of players you have and adapt the system? Um, is it is it incorporated on the opponent you're playing? You go on the system. You know all of those things as a coach. Where do you start with? Because I think a lot of coaches that get lost in, let's say they're they're setting up their methodology to teach the players, but also prep them for the game to be successful. How do you set that up to be successful and get the result? Yeah, a couple of things there. If I um, listen correctly to what you're saying, um, there is no right or wrong formation or system of play. Again, it's a subjective choice. So like I mentioned with the game model and defining your principles within the game model, you will also define your organizational structure. And, and so me, there are two things. There's a formation. And there's a system of play. A formation is a starting organization. It is how you organize, in general, the players on the field. So the players have an understanding about, okay, where, are, where is everybody located? Everybody knows their operational space or zone. So we have a higher chance of uh, uh, positive communication instead of miscommunication. A system of play is the organization of the team when we have the ball, when we lose the ball, uh, when we have to defend and when we regain the ball. So it's a fluid situation. So an example could be my starting organization would be one, four, three, three. But when we start to attack, it now goes to a one, two, three, four, or something like that, because my two fullbacks are pushed up higher. So now they're basically, uh, so the shape of the team is now becoming more fluid. Um, uh, because based on where the players are moving into and out to. Um, so the, the, but, but how you decide on that structure yeah, depends on uh, age group and the quality of the players. So if you have no players that are, have the quality to play as a 7 and 11 in a 1 4 3 3 formation, then you're going to fill that in in a different way. So you're most likely going to play a 1-4-4-2 four, four, two, yeah, with two strikers that are complementary to each other. One hey, maybe a little bit more strong, can hold the ball, and one who is dynamic and you know, finds those spaces in between. And, and now your 7-11 and 11 are not actually 7-11, but now are basically players that are able to run back and forth because they have the quality to do so. Yeah, so... Uh, based on that, you could uh, change your formation and then within that formation, your system of play based on if you have the ball or not, we have to transition. If you look at age groups, so the younger they get, so let's say you 13s and uh, you play 11 aside, but you 13s. You can also look at the characteristics of uh, children in a certain age group. Well, we know that your 13 players have difficulty to overlook uh, longer distances. So what they see is maybe just in front of them but if i'm a center back i don't see my nine yet because that's not how my brain functions yet and i certainly will not get the ball to the nine yet because that distance is way too far because i cannot actually physically get the ball there yet Mm. always exceptions there right but in in general you cannot so if you know that that they they have difficulty uh, to uh, play balls in longer from longer distances then for example a one four three three will be more appropriate for you 13 teams because now at least in my close um, proximity, I can have multiple players that I can now start to connect with. If I do that in a, maybe in a one, four, four, two, those distances maybe become longer. And then it's, I have less opportunities to, to play with my teammates or to play the, or pass the ball to my teammates. So, but when they get older, yeah, how you now start to organize your uh, your structure, yeah, your, your formation, your system of play is based on the qualities of the team, how you want to uh, want to play, um, and that can be sometimes you play one four four two, sometimes you play one four three three, 
also from a developmental standpoint. When I did the U16s um, with FC Utrecht, in the early stage of the year, we, we always played 1-4-3-3 because that was our overall structure. But also to um, throw them a curveball, you know, to make them think a little bit differently and challenge them with new situations. Somewhere in the season, I went to a 1-4-4-2. Mm. for the development of the players. And so now the formation and the system of play is not, and, and it's not the goal in itself. It's a tool for me to develop my players because it doesn't matter if I play 1-4-3-3 or 1-4-4-2, the principles that we believe in are always going to be there. But how we execute it, yeah, that's going to be different because now I'm asking different roles and responsibilities for players because they are organized in a different way. Uh, but I did that for developmental purpose. So they, so they expand their knowledge of executing principles in different situations. No, uh, until that's huge. And um, I appreciate you kind of getting into the depth of that because I know a lot of people get lost in, um, no, we got to play the four, three, three. We got to play out of the back. I get it too. At the youth, you're trying to teach a system. It takes the time and it's part of the development and aspect, but if the person cannot spray a ball at a certain distance, you got to set them up for success too, because at a point he might get discouraged and get burned out where he might have key qualities to be successful, but maybe he doesn't have the certain tools yet. Whereas a coach, if we get clever and we put them up for success and in training, they develop those tools. And when it gets there, now you can adjust the system based on that. It's huge. It's huge. And I think sometimes we're like, no, he's not getting, I think the naive mindset is, no, he's not fast enough. So, but we still want to play, kick the ball down the flank and go at it. But look, your seven and 11 are actually false seven and 11s. They're not the ones that like to make the run down the line. They like to come and tuck in. So if they like that, how do you build a system in situation and moments within the game that's going to help your team be successful, but also knowing the value they bring to make them successful. I think that's huge. I think that's the key qualities of a coach. What I want to get into now is, especially if um, coaches that are coming into your course, but outside overall, when they're in their own uh, environment, how do you deliver those messages? Is there a certain way of delivering those messages within trainings in um, having clarity amongst your players? Uh, how, how important is it to be um, selective with your words? Is it important to keep it simple or add more complexity to it to um, be intricate? Dep does it depend on who you're talking to? Um, and, you know, what is, um, how does personality play a role within getting your stuff that you've written on paper, your training, and come out onto the field in training sessions? Yeah, also here there's, uh, there's the what and the how. And so the what is, I have a gay model, and if I'm working in a club, then the club has a gay model, and how I translate that to my specific age group. So I have a good understanding, good, a good idea of the principles that I'm teaching um, in a certain organization, uh, but I also know what kind of key qualities I'm looking for within the players. And so those th three things are embedded in your game model. So the way you want to play is the way you train. It's as simple as that. Whatever you expect the players to do during the game is what you need to do in your training situation as well. It doesn't make sense to disconnect what you do in training sessions and now expect that that disconnect, the players actually understand how to connect it back to the game again. So if the game is 11 aside, then my training sessions need to have those ingredients, the same characteristics that I see in 11 aside. So for example, unpredictability, the game is unpredictable because it's ever changing there's never a same situation it's constantly changing so my players need to be very adaptable and flexible to adjust quickly to new situations 
if I don't bring those chaotic situations, those unpredictable situations in my training sessions, I cannot expect during the game that my players are capable of dealing with that. Doesn't mean you need to do 11 aside, but at least if I do 4v4 or 5v5, doesn't matter. At least those ingredients are there. Yeah, there's a way I need to go to. There's an opponent who makes it difficult for me. And based on that, and there's a there's space where I need to stay in. And based on that, I need to adapt constantly. But the principles are my tools to make the un unpredictable a little bit more predictable. So those tools, those principles help me, help my teammates, help the team in general to overcome that cha chaotic si si uh, situation um, and come up with good solutions to, you know, to be uh, as effective as possible. So in my training sessions, it needs to relate to the game. Yeah? So that's why real reality-based, that's one of our uh, tenets in, in our philosophy is so important. If there's no connection between the training session and the game, you're just wasting time. You're wasting your own time and you're wasting the player's time. And what I do in the training sessions needs to relate to the game model. Because if I want my team to play in a certain way on Saturday or Sunday, I need to help them understand that in my training sessions. Because there I have opportunity to control the situation and implementing certain principles. So my players can now start to experience those principles and get feedback on those principles. So they get a deeper understanding. And now they can start to apply it in the game again because of that deeper understanding. Doesn't mean though that I constantly going to tell them what they need to do. So hopefully coaches are able to create situations that bring out that specific behavior that you're looking for. So if one of the principles is say, let's say one of the principles and just throwing out something here is to uh, play in between the lines. That is one of our principles. I need to come up with exercises where my players are actually uh, provoked to play between the lines. So if I take out an opponent, there's no way to play in between the lines because there's no opponent. So now implementing that principle will be impossible to do. And there's no transfer from the training session to, uh, to the game as well. Same for individual intentions. If I need to understand what my individual intention is within the main principle of uh, playing in between the lines, or maybe that's a sub-principle, I need to provide opportunities for the players to think about uh, my actions, uh, the football actions, the soccer actions. Um, but if I take out an opponent, there's no fo football or soccer actions anymore. That is just, now you're working on basic actions, basically. So getting as close as possible or replicate the game as much in your training sessions is vital to develop your players within the game model. Otherwise, you know, there will be no development within the game model. And then don't be mad at the players during the game that they don't understand because it's on you, not on the players. No, that's huge. And I think that's where you've seen um, the development within our, our coaching courses with time, how it's gone more reality based where before it was structured into a set way you got to do it a set way and then by the time you're getting into the small sided and expanded game is toward the final phases of the session and now you can kind of see not big adjustments but certain adjustments of how it starts from the beginning and progresses to the end i want to kind of use that principle that you were talking about it's uh, breaking between the lines and um discuss a sample how does a sample session uh look like or you look at or vice versa you try to write for that kind of setup in your phases at let's say a b license or a license for a men's team a men's team setup is how do you start it how do you set it up and what are the focuses you're trying to get out of it yeah you can do it in a hundred different ways mm. and so Again, where are you in the development within the principles with the players will determine what kind of exercises you will use. Mm -hmm. If you want to work on sub-sub principles, uh, very small situations based on individual intentions, you're going to work in 
smaller numbers because then the repetition of those actions will occur more often than if you, let's say, do 99. Because if you do 99, sure, there's still going to be individual intentions, but less often, less frequently because uh, the numbers are bigger. Um, if you want to work on main principles, then uh, so the bigger concepts, then you're going to do that in bigger numbers because now the team uh, gets an opportunity to, to experience those main principles and start to communicate with each other and being effectful in, um, in executing that. So there's, there's a lot of flexibility in how you structure your training session. There's no one way. And what we're doing in the course is we challenge people to explain the logic behind their choices. I'm not saying you need to start small, then expand and then go to a big game. Mm. And it's just a way of doing it. But maybe you reverse it. You say, okay, I want to spend as much time on the sub, sub principles, the, the, the individual intentions uh, for this training session. But I start with 9v9. In the 9v9, I'm reiterating the main principle that we did in the previous training sessions. Because I just want to check if the players are still understanding that. Once I see they do, now I can go to smaller activities and work on the sub-sub principles that are connected to that main principle. So that's another way of organizing your, your training session. So it's not always ending with big numbers. Oh, we always need to end with big numbers because that is close to the game. Now you can also start with, with as big as possible and then work your way down to smaller numbers, depending on what is it you want to get out of the training session. You could also say, I start big. Here's the main principle. Let's go a little bit uh, smaller now so we can now introduce an, a new sub-principle, deeper information on the main principle. And now let's put it back in a bigger game again. That's another way of structuring your, your training session. So what we're trying to do in the courses, and again, we start to uh, ask those questions in the C, but mainly in the B and the A course, explain your choice. What's your rationale behind? What's your logical reasoning behind your choices so it's not just well i found it on the internet really looks like a really really good exercise you don't find your exercises on the internet period you don't find them there because the game model is specific to your situation to your players nobody else has the exact same way of playing and what you expect from your players so copy pasting exercises from somebody else doesn't make sense because that's not how that coach maybe envisioned how he or she wanted to play um, so that is, yeah, it's, it's, we try to you know, thought provoking and we're not saying it's wrong or right. We just say, explain to me why, and then we can have a conversation if it is actually makes sense. And if it's logical. No, I think that just shows the growth that we're making where I think the old mindset is, this is the set way. And if you don't do it this way, it's wrong. Now we're having a lot of the, if it's a holistic approach, if it's your point of view, it's all subjective. You got to set it up into what the situation is. Now, based on what you want to gain out of it, set it up with uh, the formation and the format you want to kind of set it going forward. My, my discussion is what transition is still people get stuck on. It's the warm up phase. The warm-up phase is um, people still are, do we still incorporate, let's just say, uh, sticking at the men's team and um, elite team of 17, 15 and up from the academies and higher is, do you incorporate the dynamics? How do you incorporate dynamic warm-up? Do you incorporate sprints and everything before they get onto a ball? Do you incorporate rondos and incorporate dynamics within the rondos? Uh, is it... Is it uh, a circle of balls in the middle and then you're, you're getting touches in and then you're going into dynamic and you sprint up? Is it, you know, what is the format? I think people of the transition of the education are still like, what's a good way of getting the session going, but mainly not getting away from the topic, but also having your players properly warmed um, in the whole environment prior to getting into your principles. Okay, before we get there, I just want to respond on another comment you made about subjectivity. Um, it doesn't mean that if things are subjective, then everything is okay. Mm. Um, we provide 
clear objective references, or at least we try to do our best yes. to provide as clear as possible objective references. Those references is basically what I'm assessing the, uh, the coaches on, how they subjectively apply that in their own situation. Yeah. So if it's about uh, periodizing a week, here's an objective reference, but how you apply that would differ from each different candidate. But can they connect that to that objective references? So that's one. Uh, now to the, um, because otherwise everything would be okay and uh, whatever we do is okay. And of course, that's not the case. If you don't have a clear understanding about a reference, um, then everything you do is not okay, of course. And so, that, so that's why we try to connect those two things. Uh, the warm-up, again, that's the choice of the coach. What do you want to get out of the warm-up? And um, we believe in two things. The warm-up is there to prepare the players for what's upcoming for the rest of your training session. So if I want to work on certain principles, what can I already do in the warm-up that the players are starting unconsciously starting to think about those principles? So if I do a what people call a passing drill with no opposition, which for me is not a passing drill because uh, it, it's a, a kicking drill because you're just kicking the ball, that's it. If you do that, then there's no transfer from the principles to a passing drill because again there's no opponent and to apply a certain principle i need to have an opponent because the opponent will, will steer or influence or impact my decision making and the execution of that decision um, but for example i can do four against one yeah. i'm not sure if you if you call that a rondo i call it more a possessional game because there's purpose behind it it's not just playing a ball around one in the middle who's running like crazy and, and hopefully he steals the ball. No, a four against one. I can now at least, as a warm-up, start to think about, okay, what can I now connect to the principle? So if, let's say, playing in between the lines would be the principle we're working on this training session, okay, can we now find diagonal passing lanes? So if we're in between the lines, we can even move on. We can advance the field. So I can create that in the four against one. I can create a situation that the players are need to be open so they can actually pass the ball forward again. Um, um, but maybe four against one is too easy for my players. So maybe my warm-up exercise will be a four against two because that fits them better because four against one is too easy for them and four, four against two is the proper uh, level for them. I think we need to get away from the idea of, okay, we always need to do something without the ball first before we can let them play no you need to be very considerate about if you start with four against one or four against two how long do you play how much rest do you give them because you gradually want to increase the heart rate uh, let the blood flow so oxygen gets to the muscles etc etc so at some point they can uh, execute high intensity quality actions that is where you want to bring them to doesn't mean that i need to run 10 laps around the field first no I can do. I can start with four against one, but if I do four against one and I let that one in the middle stand there for five minutes, yeah, I'm just gonna kill that player, right? So maybe it's just short intervals with enough rest in between, so the players can, you know, don't build fatigue on fatigue, but they are they have an opportunity to recover. And I can also start to combine things uh, from a tactical uh, perspective. Start to combine things with uh, with the principles in a four against one. But could easily be a three against two, could be a five against two. For me, the exercise is, is not relevant at this point. You design your exercise based on where the players are and what the players need in regards to your principles. This is how we envision a warm up. Um, because why would you separate things in the warm up if you? I think it's a lost opportunity to already give them unconsciously information that they can use in the rest of the training session. No, I mean that's exactly we're we're in mutual agreement on that. I I think what we were accustomed to is like you can't you can't do stuff on the ball because they're gonna pull a hamstring, a quad. They gotta do the laps. They gotta do the the opening up the gates, closing the gates. They gotta do the dynamics before you get on the ball. Because if you get on the ball without that warm up, 
you're going to pull something. You're going to hurt something. That's yes. been, that's been where. <laughs> what did you did you ever did you ever see children who were playing on the streets do a warm up first? No way. Here's the ball. They start playing, and they manage their own their own playing time. If they're tired, they're tired. They stop, and the other play, kids will play around, and then I step back in again. So, yeah. No, I, I the same thing. No, I t- I totally agree on that. Like that's why I think. If you know, when you, when you come in, you're like, oh, I got to set my bed. I got to set this. I got to, it's those routines that you've been in. So you feel like, oh, we, it's not a proper session if you don't do a warm up and you don't do a cool down at the end. You have to do the cool down. You got to do the warm up. And sometimes if you look at it from the natural, like you even said it in the streets, when do they warm up? When do they cool down? Do they, do they on the streets to go sit down? and stretch on the streets and stuff like that. I think in the end of the day, there is ways. Of, and someone even told me too, that when you finish a session, it's actually better when you go on your own a few hours later and do your stretching after that and kind of getting more flexibility and more mobility in that. So it's like everybody has a perspective of where to get it. But I think it comes down to, like you just said it, the same way of you coaching is the individual listening to their body everybody's different too. what, what they kind of get going. But I think it's routines that people put their mind to that they got to get certain things. But I totally agree. I think um, doing those certain things, uh, especially with if you're set on time, if you're set on a time, you're really wasting opportunity and time to get things going. Because um, I think it's the same way you start a game. If your warm up is without a ball is slow and it's not progression like that, you start the game slow and it's progressing like that too. So fantastic on that. I want to transition now into um, kind of our final stage of it is um, in the national team. And I think um, I want to kind of touch base on um, uh, kind of if we, in a, in a fun matter, breaking down like the men's team and kind of, um, there's an excitement buzz with the the youth we have now playing in Europe abroad. And now we have a good uh, player pool, uh, a good deep player pool. And I want to kind of get into, in your opinion, when you're observing that for like audience that obviously are following the game and they know the players in that. um, What is, what is, um, like I said, it's subjective as well. What is the system of play that you see them incorporating and, what is it in players that are right now you feel are showcasing um, a good chance? And in, in obviously, it's a longer way away from the World Cup in uh, 2026 in America in the development part and making uh, the U.S. kind of a powerhouse team going forward. Uh, what is it that you kind of are seeing come in, in, into play and what are the, uh, the stuff that we still got to incorporate to get uh, getting that national team there? Uh, that's a difficult question. Um, so let me start with that as a federation, we're in the process right now and it's a really, really uh, good process of um, redefining uh, our game model. So we're looking at okay, what would the future play look like? What it uh, so what are trends within the world right now, and what does that mean for us? So a lot of people in the federation now are actually thinking about that, which is really good because um, it gets a better understanding about um, what we want from the youth national teams as well. Right, so it trickles down to uh, below as well. So we can start to prepare players for uh, top top level. Um, so that's one thing, and the better we get in that, and uh, the more clear we are in what we expect from our players, which, which will have an, an impact on results eventually as well. Um, so for me, that, that is one of the most important things we're doing right now. Um, so yeah, and, and and I don't have conversations with. Uh, the men's and the women's national uh, head coaches uh, and the assistant coaches. So I do not know what they're actually doing. Um, I know that they're part of that process. And so I can imagine that when they play play friendlies, that they're trying to experiment with those things as well and see what fits best in regards to the player pool we have right now. Um, 
and I can imagine that with the men's game, that's even more knowing that the women's game is already, we're already here, right? But how do we stay here? How do we keep ahead of what the rest is doing? Because the rest of the world is catching up pretty, pretty fast. Uh, they're not standing still. So what do we need to do right now to make sure we keep ahead? Um, but it's difficult for me from my position to say, well, this is needed and this is needed. Um, I think it's, it's a good trend, especially in the men's game, that more young players get opportunities to play abroad and actually get playing time. And so they get exposed to uh, environments, different environments, um, different ways of playing and that just expand their knowledge about, um, about the game so that eventually that will help us um, in results as well. But yeah, that means we're going to be number two of the world or number five of the world, number 10 of the world. Nobody knows, right? So the only thing we can do is, is work hard and, and, and come up with a good plan and a way of playing and, and, and be very systematic and very organized and very aligned in that way of working. So players get the best learning environment possible um, to, uh, to, to, to develop their, their in, in individual qualities. No, and, and, and the reason I was asking that on the, both the men's and women's side, Antel, um, I think as much as the credit goes to coaching staffs on both um, men and women, on the national team level, in my humble opinion, I think it comes down to the whole organization. It comes to the federation. It comes to you guys as the uh, coaching education instructors. It comes to our um, youth structure set up from the men's side and the women's side because the national team i think that whole infrastructure properly set allows it and as you know as we're seeing how things have progressed with time i mean it's so exciting being uh, a young boy or a young lady in this uh, young girl becoming future players in this because the education of knowledge going within our structure, the youth setups they're going to get, the professionalism in every age group they're getting now, um, uh, from the men's to the women's, it's enormous. I mean, we're, I mean, and that's obviously a little have to do with the financial support as well, with time is getting more and more and more. And when it does, um, it, it shows how, um, how successful us could become and like i said i'm really excited for the world cup that's going to be held in 2026 because i truly think um it should set up for a um, successful situation and kind of the platform but i think it comes to credit to you guys i think it comes credit to everyone involved um and i think everybody plays a role in that everyone plays a role especially on the national team side where it's such a it's such a big umbrella i mean um you know what's your thoughts on uh last thing and then i'll flip it on to you kind of for closing thoughts what's your thoughts of when you're coaching a national team setup compared to a professional team because it's a lot of training camps you get you get them for a month uh, obviously, uh, and you got to periodize for a month uh, you got it like you just i think you said earlier experiment what are the you know, the things in a national team, U.S., uh, Dutch, every kind of setup, what are the priorities you're trying to kind of get from those situations? So you mean when you have them for X amount of time? You know? Yes. Yeah, so the, the difficulty of being a national team coach, of course, is the lack of time you have with the players. So um you need to prioritize in, okay, what do we think has a higher priority in what we want to develop within our game model? Um, and how, yeah, how are you going to do that? So my, so my example with, uh, when I was assistant with the youth national coaches in the Netherlands was that we had an, we had set principles and then we had them for a week uh, with, let's say one game, or sometimes we had two games in that week. Um, it was a lot of moments where you have conversations with them. So not only on the field, but also off the field. And, you, and, and what we're trying to do is create a framework. This is, okay, this is our identity. This is that we envision because that is what the Federation uh, decided on. But within that framework, involve the players to have flexibility to move around in that framework. And uh, so you 
engage them in conversations and uh, learning activities so they start to come up with their own ideas as a team within that framework, which will now accelerate the learning process because they start to think about it up front. So basically they're theorizing concepts that they think about it. It's more from them than from the coaches. So it's a, it's a joint uh, responsibility now. Um, so they are more motivated to actually execute it during the games as well. The positive of working with teams at the highest level is that they, most of them all have the quality of being adaptable and learn really, really fast. So um, what we normally did was we didn't went into detail. We introduced bigger concepts because the players are already able to execute more detailed information based on that bigger concepts. And we don't have time to, to dive into very small details anyway. So we provided a framework. They have flexibility to work within that framework. And they had a, a say in it as well. And that because of the quality of the players, they are able to execute it. And then what we saw was that, so I can still remember the game against Turkey. Our players is high, <laughs> Turkish players, something like this. So we just got knocked out the first half. But based on the clear principles we had, that st structure and the adaptability of the players that they now feel like, okay, yeah, we need to do something completely different. This is not enough at this level to be successful. So they had a quick understanding about, okay, this is not what we need to do within our principle. Let's do it like this now. And then you could see a quick turnover in the second half, or sometimes we play games against the same opponent. You could see this, the second game, we were way more dominant because we were adapted to the, the, the initial situation. So that is what you hope to create within uh, a national camp is that the players take that general concepts, that bigger concepts and individualize it in the game because of their knowledge and adapt quickly from new situations so you can see a learning curve coming, uh, coming up. But yeah. everybody understands that you don't have much time so uh, not too much information, but more information about the same thing. That is what we did in all kinds of different settings. No, I mean, that's fantastic. And I, again, until, I don't even say it lightly, it's an absolute pleasure getting you back on and for us to talk about this beautiful game and, you know, give education and perspective to our audiences to, to keep thinking in in different ways and be open but staying original to themselves too obviously everybody has their unique styles but how do you take knowledge from here knowledge from here knowledge from here and spin it into your environment and creating that positive environment for your own players to making them better and thinking out of the box so again absolute pleasure I want to put um, put it on your plate to kind of close this out and any projects you have coming on, any um, announcements of um, the the license courses being uh, being announced for when to apply, anything that the audience needs to be aware of coming soon for 2021. Uh, and then we go from there. Yeah, just first I want to expand on uh, your last comment about being open-minded and, and thinking outside of the box. What I've noticed the last year that we're all living in a virtual environment, there are a gazillion webinars out there, uh, coaches presenting, uh, which is okay. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but people need to understand that if a coach presents the how he or she does, don't copy that. Try to extract information that is objective that is a reference that you can use in your own environment but if if you attend a webinar from i'll say Mourinho, and he explains how he does things at tottenham it doesn't mean that how he does it actually works for your environment as well but maybe you can filter things that are objective really clear references that just hey i didn't know that that's new for me that's a good reference. Let me now start to apply that reference in my context, in my way. So the how I do it will be different. And I think that's really important. Otherwise, we're just going to copy paste things from, from other coaches. And then we say, 
uh, we blame the players because they are not ready or they cannot understand it or whatever it is. No, it's your fault because uh, you think you can copy paste something that somebody does at the highest level actually works for your environment as well. It doesn't work like that. Um, then the second thing, what's upcoming is, uh, you know, we're still in, in the rounds of courses right now. So we're still finishing those. So hopefully in April or not, hopefully in April or May, we'll actually close those, uh, the current B's and A's. Um, the C's are already planned out for the, for the, for this year. I think we have planned out 57 C courses. So we're really, really uh, excited about that because that's a huge increase of what we did in the past. And then in the next couple of months, we will, um, yeah, uh, announce uh, um, the application for the B and A as well. We're not quite sure when yet because we also need to think about, okay, what's the pandemic going to do with us? How will we organize? At some point, we want to return to in-person. We're still planning on to do so, but it all depends on how the pandemic goes on and on because we don't want to bring people into dangerous situation, of course. So maybe we say um, we start virtual and then maybe hopefully in 2022 or late 2021 we can do an in-person meeting but we're still yeah deciding on that fantastic thank you again so much you're welcome